So good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Mike Collins. I work for a company called DPG, Developing People Globally. We specialize in HR and L&D qualifications. So we develop capability in HR and L&D. My area of interest, my area of um, specialism, if you like, is specifically around developing learning communities, both offline and online. And some of the work that I've done at DPG over the last three years has been around connecting people and getting people to share knowledge, to develop, to learn, to then apply and make themselves better at what they do. So I'm hoping you're enjoying the two-day conference. Was anybody here yesterday? Show of hands, anybody here yesterday? Fantastic, you've come back today. First day, anybody today? Fantastic, okay. So you, you'll have probably got your kind of to grips with the layout. So over there, you've got this huge area that's all specializing in technology, shiny gadgets, amazing technology. And then as you walk over here, there's a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit that's focused on skills. Quite an interesting balance around tech, 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 small area for skills. When in actual fact, really, what we should be doing is flipping it and concentrating on skills. Because technology is just merely the enabler. So this talk isn't going to be about technology, although there is a small part of technology. This is about hearts, minds, and behaviors. This is about us as, as people, as humans, and how we can apply and use the tools around us to help foster those connections and relationships. So just a show of hands, who's a member of a community of practice at the moment? What's a community of practice? That's a very good question. I will, sh I will share with that uh, very soon. Um, who is thinking about learning communities in their own organization at the moment? Yeah, so this is something that's um, you know, been out in the uh, Towards Maturity Benchmark Report. In every sort of report that you look at for L&D, they talk about social, they talk about mobile, they talk about connectivity, they talk about harnessing the power of the organization. And one of the ways in which you can do that is through learning communities. So if learning communities and social networks aren't part of your L&D strategy and how you're trying to help people become better at learning and getting access to knowledge within your organization, then it's something that I really do hope that you leave today thinking that this is what we need to go, this is what we need to do and this is what we need to approach. So five Ps, I'm gonna talk through five Ps. Each one a little letter starting with P, but it's not just words, okay? What I like to think of them, I'll just turn this on, there you go. Is these are pillars, these are the basis, these are the foundations in which you can apply your knowledge and work through this framework to create a successful and thriving learning community. Uh, this is a handout that you've got, and I'm gonna kind of take you around each of the five Ps and hopefully make some sort of sense. So let's look at the first one, purpose. When you're looking at a community of practice and you're starting to think about what we're gonna do and how we're gonna apply the community into whatever context, you've got to start with purpose. Because without purpose, you can't go on. There's no foundation to start with. So purpose is absolutely key. So when you're thinking about when you're gonna create and start a, a community that's gonna support learning, your purpose is key. We're gonna spend a couple of minutes thinking about what your purpose is. And rather than me talk about it, I'm gonna bring in um, a guy that you've probably heard of, Simon Sinek, who talks about how great leaders inspire action. And some of the things that you're probably battling with your own organization is getting buy-in and getting people to support the idea that actually we want people to talk to one another. We actually want to connect people. We want people to share knowledge. We don't want people to hoard knowledge. So purpose is absolutely key. So hopefully this is gonna work. And before we do that, I'm gonna answer your question, which is what is a community of practice? So this is a community of practice. So according to Lave and Wenger, a community of practice is groups of people who share a concern or passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly. So I'll get, I'll get out of the way if you want to take a picture. So this is about people. They're sharing a concern, a passion, an interest. They need to know something, and it's about getting these people to interact regularly. Of course, now in the 21st century, that doesn't just have to be face-to-face. -face. There are so many tools that you can do that connect people offline as well as online. So the way that I like to think about creating a purpose is starting with why. So if you can help decide what the why is, then it helps people understand the why for them and what they're going to get from this community so there's more chance of them joining in and getting, getting, uh, getting involved. So I'm going to hand over to Simon, and Simon's going to talk you through starting with why. And it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why? How, what? 
this little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. So there you go. Really simple premise. Don't start with the what or the how, you start with the why. And as Simon's just said there, the inspired people, the inspired organizations start with why. They help people understand the reason why they need to be involved in something. And I'm assuming because you're here today that you are all inspired people. You're thinking about how you can connect people and create learning communities in your own organization. So one of the things I want to challenge you with today is know your purpose. I want you to think about why you want to create a learning community. Why you want to bring people together. What's the purpose? Okay, so you don't need to kind of come up with it right now, but just think about in your own organization or in the work that you're doing, what is your purpose? Just 30 seconds thinking about your purpose. Take your time, shut your eyes, get up, move around. 30 seconds, just think about your purpose and be really clear on how you would explain that purpose to somebody else. Write it down. Take something away from this session, tangibly that you can take back into your own organization, have a conversation with somebody. Talk about purpose, start with why. Because if people buy what you believe and people believe what you believe, then that's the most powerful concept to start with. So answer the why. Okay, so once you know your purpose, what you need to be able to do is package that purpose and you'll be able to work it up into something called an elevator pitch. Because if you can't explain your purpose when somebody says, right, why should I invest in uh, a, a you know, learning community? And you go, uh, 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 it, well, everybody else is talking about it, so it must be great. But if you can actually talk and summarize in a paragraph or a few sentences to why you should invest in creating learning communities, then that's a really powerful thing to be able to get buy-in and support. And obviously, the people who are going to be using your community will start to understand one of the key things. And that takes us on to the second P. As I say, this is a bit of a whistle-stop tour. So number two P is people. Because of course, without, a, without people, you have no community. You just have a kind of you know, lone guy having conversations with himself. So people is absolutely key. And if you understand your purpose, and you understand your why, and you've got that motivation, then that answers the what's in it for me. And you'll hear this everywhere, don't you? What's in it for me? Answer the what's in it for me. The WWIFM. Of course, but truly think about why people would want to invest their time in a community, what they're going to get from it. How can you sell the benefits? How can you sell the value for them? How can you demonstrate value so that actually people want to come and join in this community and get something from it? So if you answer the what's in it for me, then straight away they can see a benefit and they will give you the time and effort that it deserves as opposed to, well, I don't really see the point. And so many learning communities turn into ghost towns because they don't answer the what's in it for me, especially in an online capacity. If you aren't listening to your people and they're not telling you and you're not understanding what that concern and what that shared interest is, then your community is not going to get off the ground in any way, shape or form. And it will become a ghost town. And then people will say, oh, well, it's not, it's not the right way to go. So think about the what's in it for me. And the other thing that you need to think about is what's in it for business. What is in it for your organization? Is it to uh, support knowledge management more effectively? Is it to enable people to get access to sales materials or sales knowledge? Is it about creating a network so that actually communication is two-way as opposed to one-way, just email through internal communications? Think about why this is better for business. So very briefly, I want to talk just through this, this law of innovation curve. Um, so think about your own organization at the moment. Think about your L&D team. Think about the people who are in that team. It might just be yourself or you might actually have a team. 
So think about where the people in your team actually are. Are they innovators? You know, are they the ones over in the uh, learning technologies going, oh my God, I'm a magpie, where's the shiny gadget? I want to go and try this because it's cool and it's great and it looks ace and it's going to cost me a lot of money. Are they sort of early adopters? So actually, yeah, they get something, they can see the value, they want to play, they want to experiment, they want to be quite brave. And this is what we need in L&D. You know, we need bravery, we need experimentation, we need people that can actually see technology and see a purpose in a way and actually apply it in a very real way that benefits people, supporting them learning, that links, of course, to improve performance and, and increase knowledge. So this chasm here is a big gap between the innovators and early adopters and it's that touching point where actually it starts to become the early majority. So that's where people start to start to get it. And then all of a sudden the late majority are kind of like, well, everyone else is doing it, so I'm feeling a bit weird now, I'm feeling a bit isolated. So I'm going to join in now anyway. And the laggards, every team has a laggard. Every team has a Luddite, somebody who's pen and paper. That's the way we communicate. None of that fancy dangle technology stuff. But every team has a laggard. And these are really important because they're usually quite influential people. So think about the approaches that you're going to take in getting buy-in and support from people. And just very briefly, because you can go into this for hours, but a community has a life cycle. And don't think that your community is going to last forever. Nothing lasts forever. A community can be quite short-lived. It can be supporting part of a formal uh, learning program. It can be something that um, you know, your organization is looking at changing the way and means in which they communicate and share information. So it could be quite large scale, could be quite short, uh, small scale. Uh, but you kind of get this inception, this inception phase where the community is forming. You then got the establishment phase where people are starting to understand how they're using the community and how they're getting information from it. Then you get to sort of a maturity phase where actually this is just the way that it's done until finally you come out of the end and your community will either break up because there's actually no need for it or your, that community will actually form other communities because people have connected and shared information about what they actually need. So that community is not meeting their needs anymore, so they go on and form their own community. So community life cycle is key and just very briefly, this is one of the, uh, the ways in which I kind of thought about uh, the slope of enlightenment. So if you think about change in your organization, change is pretty hard. Yeah, it's not easy. You've got, to, you've got to kind of roll your sleeves up, you've got to dig deep, and you've got to stick to what you believe. Otherwise, you know, change, uh, change initiatives will start, they'll stop, they'll falter, and then something else will happen. So very quickly, anyone familiar with the Gartner hype cycle? It's where you introduce a bit of technology and, um, or something different, and all of a sudden you think, oh my god, yes, we're going to change the world. Come on. And then you introduce it, and then all of a sudden you go, oh, actually, this is not going to be easy. This is going to be really hard work. And you end up in the trough of disillusionment. And the people who are usually doing that, if you think that's the innovation curve, are the early adopters, the innovators, and people who are being brave. And as soon as that happens, they hit the trough of disillusionment. And that's where most change programs, that's where most technology, that's where most bravery sort of disappears. Because to change a culture in an organization or to change the way it means that people actually genuinely just believe, because that's the way we've always done it, it's very easy just to give up. However, what we need to do is focus on these. We need to focus on hearts and minds. We need to focus on skills development, around how people communicate both offline and online, the benefits of people connecting and sharing. And actually, sharing is a skill. You know, being able to share information, to find and filter information, to curate content, to, to, to bring people in, to be a connector. That is a key skill for learning and development professionals, in my opinion. And it is about how you can apply that knowledge and how you can create value for others in the organization, not just yourself. And then all of a sudden, you keep going up this slope of enlightenment until you get the early majority, the late majority, and all of a sudden, it's just the way that things are done. And in five years' time, you look back going, why, why didn't we communicate in this way? Why didn't we connect and share with people in this way? And especially in off online communities, um, one of the biggest challenges is, is getting sort of people who just lurk and consume information. How do you get them to be active contributors and, and actively involved in your community? And in large part, that is down to one of the other P's I'm going to talk about. But love your lurkers. Lurkers will tell you a lot of information about what content is valuable, what content's being used. Uh, and ultimately, your lurkers form a huge part of your, um, your community. 
if you look at the, the, the 99, uh, the 99 one rule, so 1% 1 of people will contribute to a lot of content, 9% of people will get involved on an irregular basis, and then 90% will just sit back and consume. And that's very much how the internet works. Okay. So people are absolutely fundamental. You need to explain your purpose, and people need to buy into that purpose. So what are people actually looking for in a community then? Any ideas? It's on your handout. They are looking for product. So third P, absolutely essential, because you've got to get your product right. OK, I'm going to show another video. And I have to, I have to say, uh, it's a bit of a naughty video. There are two swear words in it. So if you are easily offended, just put your hands over your ears. And I'll wave to you when, when the swear words have gone away. But I just think this sums up perfectly for me, supply and demand. Brad, show them how it's done. Boom. Sell me that pen. Watch. Go on. Let me show this fucking pen. That's my boy right there. This pen. Fucking right. sell anything. Why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you name down that napkin for me? I don't have a pen. Exactly. Supply and demand, my friend. You know what I'm saying? Shit. It's creating urgency. Oh Simply getting to want to buy this stuff. Get some, it's something that they need. You know? Okay, so supply and demand, creating urgency, creating a need. If your product is not meeting the needs of your audience, your people, and that doesn't tie in with the purpose of what the community is there for, then you're not, you don't have a product. You've got no reason for people to get involved. You've got no, people, no, no, no reason for people to connect and to come and to share. So you need to understand your product. Your product is absolutely essential. Think like a marketeer. Don't think like an L&D professional. Think like a marketeer. How do we sell what we do to the people that we work with? You know, people outside of work are awash with sexy commercials, great looking video, great looking content. That content is out there. So we just have to find it, we need to harness it, we need to curate, create, and we need to use the tools around us to be able to create a compelling reason why people need and want this product. So in a community, in a learning community, what do you think our, our product is? So change, yes. Yeah. So change could be an outcome of, of, of a community getting together, either changing individual behavior or, or, or organizational culture or the way things are done. Anybody else? Anybody think of any other experiences? Yeah, fantastic. So product could be oh, throwing things around um, through stories, for example. So your product could be stories. How do we, how do we capture and, and combine stories within our organization to help people understand what change is happening? One of the things from a learning community that people are going to come from is knowledge. A thirst for knowledge. Why are they going to come to your community? Because actually, people in the community are sharing and actually quite knowledgeable on the subject, on the product. Right, I actually understand the what's in it for me because that applies to my job role. We're talking about sales techniques or operational processes or risk. You know, that community on webinars, actually, I'm interested in, in, in that. So there's a reason for me to go there. So knowledge. And one of the biggest barriers that you will find creating communities is this concept that knowledge is power. And this is, this is, this is sometimes a traditional um, concept that knowledge is power. And one of our roles as uh, learning professionals, as community uh, managers, as connectors, is to change that mi mindset from knowledge is power to this one. This is absolutely essential. This is key. So power is gained by sharing knowledge and not hoarding it. However, in so many organizations, so many individuals hold on to that concept that what I know makes me unique, makes me a PowerPoint in the organization. Why would I want to share what I know with other people? Why do I want to give them an advantage? In the 21st century, in a workplace where we want to work and we want to feel meaningful work, why isn't it that you can't go and help other people and develop other people's knowledge from what you know? That is where true power comes from, in sharing knowledge with other people, enabling other people to become better at what they do. And L&D have a key part to play in that. So knowledge sharing, how do you go about doing that? OK, so there's a couple of things around your, your product. Out. Um, needs to create content. So where's this content going? Is it going to come from uh, minutes? Is it going to come from uh, webinars? Is it going to come from um, 
meetings? Is it going to come from classroom content? Is it going to come from Flipchart? Is it going to come from resources, photographs, video, blogs, discussions, video, interviews? Where's your, where's your content going to get creative? You know, where is the content coming from in your organization? Where can you create content from? Get people to contribute content that is on a, a, on a vein to your product. You know, go and talk to people about what the sorts of things that they're working on. You know, if you want to uh, check out uh, work for John Stepper, which is Working Out Loud. So John Stepper has created this, uh, this, this Working Out Loud approach, which is five steps to Working Out Loud. And it's a really powerful, compelling way to encourage people to show what they're working with. Is it worth swapping over? Because this happened yesterday, and it's just it hurts your ears if I'm cutting out. I'm probably hurting you anyway. But so while he does that, talk about, think about your product, think about where you're going to create this content from. And the second way, and probably easier in some respects, is to curate. So there's creation, and there's curation. So one of the um, one of the guys that I encourage you to look at and follow is uh, a guy called Martin, Martin Cousins. So if you think about curation in a museum context, what do, uh, what do curators do? They, they, they find artifacts, they put them in order, they filter and find and explain what it is. So for an L&D professional, this is absolutely essential because if we can curate and find different articles and posts and content from externally as well as internally, then we've got the ability to create compelling content. We've got a product. So a couple of things that you can look at when you curate. Think about curation as finding filtering and sharing. So this is different to aggregation. So aggregation is like an RSS feed where you're just pulling in lots and lots of different content and there's lots of different RSS feeds out there that you can, uh, tools that you can use. Curation, there is a human element. There is finding content and there is filtering content. So that means that you're filtering what actually, what content you want people to see in your community. And then you can add your own insight, you can add your own context, you can encourage people to comment on that. You know, what does that mean, for example, if I'm sharing a, a you know, a, a, issue on difficult conversations. You know, how does that apply to the work that you're doing? Tell me a story from when, you, when you've had that. And then that, that might get 20, 30 readers. So again, that, uh, that, that can create change. And once you've done that, you can share it. And a couple of things that we're doing at DPG is using uh, these three tools. So Flipboard, create wonderful looking magazines. You can embed them in, uh, in, 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 a, in a web page. Scoop it. So Scoop it's a great tool for finding content adding a little bit of uh, context of yourself, and then again, adding it to an online format. You can share it in links, you can embed it. And then Storyfy. So if you've not checked out Storyfy before, again, Storyfy is a great way of telling stories. You can drag content in from YouTube, from Twitter, um, from WordPress. You've got all these kind of online tools that integrate into it. And you just create nice little stories of, um, of what people have been talking about and sharing. So just three tools that you can have a look at. OK, so as soon as somebody starts talking about communities, and this is, that was my set to begin with, I always thought about online. So online communities where I've had the majority of my experience. However, a lot of those communities also had offline presences. So one of the great examples is L&D Connect, which is a, a network of L&D professionals um, who get together uh, on, a, on a sort of quarterly basis. They run events, but there's a really strong online presence as well. And when you think about communities, it's not about online versus face-to-face. -face. It's about a balance. It's about going back to your purpose. Is there a need for people to get together face-to-face? -face? How can we use the online environments to support either pre, during, or after those face-to-face -face events? How can you keep the conversations going? So if you're working on a formal program at the moment, whether it's for managers, leaders, whether it's for sales staff, whether it's for claims people, whether it's for a complaints department, how can you use online tools to get messages and get interaction and create that sort of connectivity before the event? How can you then harness that event during the workshop or during that face-to-face -face time? And then how can you encourage those conversations to continue afterwards? And then how can you amplify the great conversations that people have been having and the, the outputs of those and sharing those stories with others? Because all it takes is one good story, one little spark to be able to create movement and momentum. And this is where DPG ourselves have, have had great success over the last three years, is blending a sort of online um, community of practice with face-to-face -face activities, workshops, programs so that we can help people connect and get access to content before they even come near the face shop, before they're building relationships with one another before, they're even, before they've even met. 
And what it does, it really strikes that strong relationship to enable people to um, you know, foster better relationships and trust. And trust is essential when you're talking about sharing information and sharing knowledge. How do you build trust? Just, just very quickly on that as well, the DPG community is completely free, so you can access it. Um, I'll send out the link or you can chat to us on the stand in a little bit. Uh, but feel free to kind of have a look at how it's structured, how the sorts of uh, things are, are laid out, the sorts of content that we share. You know, steal with pride is a great motto. Feel free to come and just replicate it somewhere. Uh, take the content and pass it on to your colleagues. Um, and one of the good things about it is it's accessible mobile, tablet, and desktop. And that's another thing that we need to think about when you're talking about access. How do we provide people with access? And then finally, the last P, and I think I've got about four minutes left. So this is the, 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 the key, the key P, the Pied Piper. And guess what? You are all Pied Pipers. What do I mean by Pied Piper? So these people are the ones that lead. Talk about that innovation curve. You're the innovators. You're the people that take an idea and actually do something with it. You gain momentum. You build a following. You help people see the why. You help people connect, you nurture, you support, you coach, you discuss, you have conversations with people. And the Pied Piper is essential to that because L&D is at a really interesting time at the moment. And I don't know whether you ever saw the, the, the post by Jane Hart on traditionalists versus the modernists of L&D. And whether you disagree or not, L&D is a fantastic opportunity to harness the tools that enable better skills development. They give us so many more opportunities to build our skills and to offer more benefit to organizations. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model we have is this. It's, I believe we have a system of education that is modeled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, uh, ringing bells, separate facilities, uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. You know what I mean? Well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines, you know, or at different times of the day, or better in smaller groups than in large groups, or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula, and it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. So that's Sir Ken Robinson talking about changing the paradigms in ed the educational system. I firmly believe that we've got to do exactly the same in the corporate world. We've got to change that mindset that actually training happens in a conformed way. So how do we disrupt the corporate model of education? One of the ways in which we do that is give people the opportunity to connect with one another through communities. So there's a lot of different options and a, di a lot of different... Um, roles in L&D at the moment, whether this is happening in your organization or not. So again, this work is by, by Jane Hart. And as you can see, you know, whether you talk about being a performance consultant, a learning advisor, course and resource developers, trainees, course facilitators, LMS facil administrators, you've got training, performance support, and then this key one here, collaboration advisors. So I, I attended the Learning Technologies Conference in 2007 and heard a talk and the day after I went back into my organization, created a community that was a free platform at the time. And only through experimenting and trying something different have I been able to, 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 to kind of learn as I've been going. And it's still you know, refining everything as you go through. But it's about being that catalyst. It's about creating that movement and having the sheer guts and determination to say, actually, I'm going to do something else. And I want to take you on that journey. I want to show you how to do that. You know, and you can help me do that as well. Um, so I'm pretty much out of time, but there's a couple of things left. I'm not going to show you the video, but if you want to learn how to create a movement and you want to... You've um, learned a lot about I'm just going to turn that off because it's quite loud. But if, you, if you're ever feeling down in the dumps and you're thinking, oh, God, I'm not getting a lot of, uh, I'm not getting a lot of love here, go and watch uh, Leadership Lessons by Dancing Guy because th he's the guy who will give you the inspiration and motivation to stick with change and to find that first follower. And that's really key in trying to change the way and means in which we do things in L&D. 
Okay, so I talked about elevator pitches before. I talked about sort of compelling reasons to, to want to get involved and do things. So this is my elevator pitch. So DPG, we sell L&D and HR qualifications. Want to buy one? No, 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 that's not good enough. Okay, so let's try again. So we believe, DPG believe, in a space for people to connect, share and learn, a space to be the best they can be. We help people grow and transform, creating the future workforce today. Want to learn with us. So the same thing, just apply into a different what's in it for me. And what's in it for me is developing L&D capabilities, about understanding L&D, learning methodology and how we can apply it in new and different ways. So that's our time today. Hopefully you found that useful. You've made some notes, you've scribbled down. I'm going to be on stand uh, R2 throughout the day. There's some bags with some DPG goodies in here. First come, first served. Um, well, please feel free to come and, come and grab a bag. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And if you've got any questions, be happy to kind of field them afterwards. Uh, thank you for your time.